thank you for joining us for another episode of Health Conditions Corner. I'm Sonia Thompson, Community Content Manager for Supply Side 365, but the person you're really here to see, the guy with all the knowledge and charisma, is David Foreman, aka the Herbal Pharmacist. David, how are you doing? I don't know what to say after that one. I'm awesome. I, uh, I have just everybody knows I'm joining you from Madrid. It's already happy hour here. So uh, for everybody that's on the West Coast, it's, you know, I know you guys are struggling through your coffee. I actually have a glass of wine poured for as soon as this puppy's over. <laughs> very, very nice. Yeah, I was going to say you're the fun fact. You're in Madrid right now. And last yep. week you were at Vita Foods Europe, right? Yep. Yeah. And by the way, I, I do have to say um, within Informa and all the different platforms they have, um, I find the innovation that comes from uh Vita Foods Europe to be like the ultimate of quality uh for sure I I think everybody still defaults that supply side west is the best show in our industry but yeah it's uh uh just the things you see the things you learn you know it's a different perspective than the U.S. market so yeah it was a good time uh I highly encourage people to uh to get outside your comfort zone and travel outside the U.S. and and try some of these other really awesome uh uh, shows that, that, that are within Informa. Well, we feel really fortunate that you're taking the time, especially across different time zones, to be with us again today. Uh, oh, this thanks. episode of Health Conditions Corner, David is going to be talking about gut health. But before he begins, I want to let everyone know that if you have any questions for David, he's always happy to answer them. So please post them in the chat feature, and we'll get to them if we have time at the end of this presentation. Without further ado, David, do you want to start sharing your screen? We're ready for you to rock and roll. Yay. It should be up in front of everybody's face now. Yes, that was me with a headshot before I had glasses. Uh, anyway, so today's topic, if you didn't already know, and you should have because you probably signed up for this, uh, today we're going to be, uh, my my concept was inside the gut um, and beyond the microbiome. Uh, I'm going to be a buzzkill for almost everybody right now. I am not going to spend very much time uh, with the microbiome specifics. So you're not going to hear me talking about too much about probiotics, prebiotics, postbiotics, blah, 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 anything biotic, I guess, these days. So granted, they're going to get mentioned, but this is that is not really the focus here. If you've ever attended my, uh, my webinars in the past, you know that I like to think outside the box. And uh, but before we even start, you know, climbing outside the box, I like to give everybody a little taste of what we're talking about with regards to gut health. And since I know everybody can read, I don't read slides. Uh, but real quick, you know, these were three really compelling numbers that I found with regards to statistics on digestive health. Um, when you consider that 40% of Americans' lives, you know, daily lives are, are disrupted by digestive issues. Um, I remember when I owned my pharmacy years ago, the largest section of OTCs um, in a pharmacy was devoted to uh, devoted to digestive care um, for for probably multiple decades. Uh, the drugs that were the most popular, um, you know, as in numbers of prescriptions, probably other than hormone replacement therapy back in the day, um, were all things digestive. Um, so you can see also that 60%, so it's kind of weird that 40% of Americans have, you know, their their daily lives, you know, interrupted by digestive issues, but 60% of people are actually suffering from some sort of a gastrointestinal disease. And yes, I know in our industry, we can't talk about diseases. So that's not what I'm doing here. Just letting you know, like, that's just a big representation of, of really how many people are affected. And if you're in the dietary supplement industry and you're looking at what category of supplements should we be looking into? Um, all things digestive based on these numbers alone. And then of course, just the number of millions of people that you know visit their doctors, et cetera. So it's a, it's a large area. I mean, it's kind of like, duh, after you see these numbers and yet there's still tons of companies, even really highly well-respected broad lines that still don't have a lot of um, ingredients in the space. And let's take it a little bit further. Um, the connection between gut health or I'm not actually, let's not say gut anymore, David. We're going to talk about gastrointestinal tract health is what we're talking about. So usually when we talk about gut, people are talking about small and large intestine. 
that's only just a whiff of what I'm going to be discussing today. But we can see areas of health that are structure function compliant. Um, if you think about it, that your digestive tract is, uh, you know, if it's not functioning properly, no matter what you eat, you can have the best diet drink the best beverages, et cetera, et cetera, take the best supplements. But if it's not functioning properly, you're not getting those nutrients into your body to be utilized by your cells. So that can basically lead to anything and all things breaking down. And then you throw in the fact that another part of the digestive system is to actually eliminate, you know, toxins and waste. You don't get, you know, not getting those things out. You also are causing many different conditions to go wrong. So obviously I'm not going to read off of what those conditions are, but you can see the big ones are right there. And then the other part of it is, you know, just really the signs of an unhealthy gut. And no, this isn't necessarily for the people. I know these are supposed to be targeting more so R&D, but I always feel like it's just good for us to wrap our heads around some of the signs of an unhealthy gut, because these are other areas in which you might want to look at adding ingredients. Let's use an example off this page right here. Sleep issues are a sign of an unhealthy gut. So perhaps considering it, Maybe a new formulation for your, your probiotic line uh, where you're incorporating an ingredient for sleep as well. I was actually, I was in Madrid today to, um, <clears throat> excuse me, speak to the board of directors for a company that actually has a sleep ingredient. And that was actually one of the suggestions I had for them today was to use their sleep ingredient and uh, maybe do some studies with probiotics as well. But we can see there are a lot of um, signs of an unhealthy gut. Again, I don't like reading slides and I don't want to spend too much more time on this, but you can see there really are an awful lot of uh, areas that are very common in our lives that we may not realize are truly the sign of an unhealthy um, gastrointestinal tract. <clears throat> Sorry, I've been talking all day. I do have water. It's not, I've been drinking wine, but so excuse me for clearing, <clears throat> clearing my throat. So contributing factors to poor gut health. Um, real quick, diet, including those food sensitivities, not allergies, but sensitivities can contribute just overall inactivity, certain medications, again, going back to stress and sleep, um, and even weight changes. And weight change is either pro or con. You lose, you've lost weight for whatever reason, or you've gained a lot of weight. These will also cause um, issues with your digestive tract. All right, so let's get into the real reason people are attending this, not for all that stuff, but this which is there are really four main functions of the gut. Again, in our industry, for because the microbiome is so hot right, right now, and probiotics and pre and post and symbiotics and all that stuff. And I'm not, you know, I'm not, not no pun intended, I'm not poo-pooing on that. And you know, you guys all know my sarcasm. If you paid attention to me, that would be definitely an herbal pharmacist dad joke there. But there's there's really these are the four main main functions of the gut. Um, you know, so we have motility, and what does that mean? So it, motility involves your esophagus. <clears throat> so motility really is when I chew my food and start and swallow it, then there's these muscle contractions, you know, in and out that slowly move the food through your body. So that affects your esophagus, stomach, small and large intestine. And you can see I listed some of the conditions that are linked to, in this case, poor motility uh, can lead to uh, GERD. Uh, it can lead to indigestion and vomiting with stomach. It can lead to uh, what they call dysmotility in the small intestine. Things are just not moving through properly. And in the large intestine, it can lead to one of two things. If you are if it's you have too much motility, which a lot of people do, that lead to diarrhea. And if you don't have enough, you're just not going to the bathroom every day. There's an old saying. I learned at one of my first conferences I ever went to in natural medicine back when I was the nerdy little pharmacist. And somebody said, how many bowel, I asked how many bowel movements should you have per day? And the answer is for every meal you've eaten. Just think about it. A baby eats, sleeps, poops, eats, sleeps, poops. That's how we're supposed to be. So if you're not doing that, then you better be having one really large one a day um, because that's what you're designed to do. Um, and for whatever reason, the lifestyle of other things, we're not doing that. So the second function is digestion. You're basically breaking down those nutri uh, nutrients that are in our food, supplements, et cetera. There's two main things that happen here. There's a mechanical version, which is part of that motility. It also involves the chewing that you do in your mouth. Hopefully you're chewing and not just gulping your food down. And then there's the chemical component um, with different enzymes, et cetera, that get produced or secreted by the body. Um, digestion is also imp important for converting those nutrients um, into perhaps the more the bioavailable form or the form that the body's going to use. And then there are other players that kind of fit into this digestive part 
and that would be the liver, gallbladder, and pancreas. And they uh, they secrete different things, compounds, enzymes, etc., uh, that will help the body break down the food or utilize it. And then uh, third third step of this or third function is absorption. Uh, this is primarily done uh, in the small intestine. So the majority of what you're very little gets absorbed in the stomach, like very little. Um, the majority of it gets absorbed or nutrients get absorbed in the small intestine. So like for people that have had uh, surgery where they've had a, a large section of their small intestine removed, they usually have some very significant uh, challenges with uh, uh, eventually their body breaking down because they're not able to have such a vast area to absorb those nutrients so the body can you know, either build or repair or maintain itself. Um, it's also uh, important for not, uh, for also, uh, controlling the water levels in your body, uh, bringing water into your body. Um, and then the last uh, last part of it for balancing water, it really could be as well. Uh, and then the last area is secretion, which is the release of uh, enzymes, hormones, and other digestive aids. So these are the four main functions of the gut. And as uh, I try to do in all of my uh, health condition corner uh, segments is I like to then uh, give you a little deeper dive onto what ingredients fit into those categories and just for just for uh for for fun's sake uh primarily in my ingredient discussion from here on out and formulating ideas i'm speaking about things that um or list things relatively generic i.e not trade names i may mention a trade name but i really try to keep this uh, from being that way um, if you see a trade name, it's usually because that's the only there. That's the only only version of that on the marketplace. Um, so, with regards to supporting motility, um, three main things that we can discuss. I talked about them earlier just a second ago. The one is has to do with the the reflux or uh, indigestion. We can see here uh, betaine or betaine hydrochloride is what usually call, uh, called. Um, that helps with the uh, acid uh, secretion, et cetera, of the body. Uh, probiotics have shown to play a, an important role. Uh, ginger, peppermint, and actually anything that would be considered a bitter, a bitter herb, or if you're not, if you're watching from Europe or the UK, uh, we'll say herb instead. Um, but these are all, all things that bitter herbs help stimulate uh, the digestive process. They also will show up throughout my presentation because they also will help the body secrete certain digestive enzymes and other, other uh, we'll call them pro factors. How about that? Uh, to help with uh, supporting um, the digestive system in a, as a whole. Um, one of the big things I want to talk about with regards to reflux and indigestion that way gets overlooked, and we overlook this too much in our industry, is magnesium. Magnesium is one of the most critical minerals that we can take as a dietary supplement across almost every health challenge. It, to me, it's the most important mineral that we can, we can look at. Uh, um, most people don't know if they're getting enough and there's a really simple finger stick blood test that you can order. You can order it online. I do it twice a year to find out because people say, well, how much magnesium should I take? And I'm, Oh, it depends. It depends on your lifestyle. So I highly recommend, you know, and, and by the way, in, in my opinion, looking at just in with regards to reflux and indigestion, you could almost use all of those. I mean, you could literally come up with a product that contained all of these ingredients if they were all stable together. Let's put it that way. So with regards to a slowly, a slowly moving uh, intestinal tract, uh, that's when it's slow moving. We're talking about um, the people that are more prone to constipation. Magnesium is my favorite thing. Uh, to use, I travel with it because when you travel multiple time zones, I'm six hours away from where I normally live, um, that you end up usually having screwed up motility, we'll say, um, partly because of travel, partly because of dehydration from travel, but also just the time change things. And magnesium is one of those things I love to use as well. Of course, uh, pre and probiotics, um, and most prebiotics are the prebiotic fibers, so fiber flows really well into this. And then another one uh, here that I, I love to use is, is aloe. And keep in mind, they're definitely trademarked, you know, clinically proven aloe. There's a, you know, clinically proven globe artichoke above. Um, but I'm, again, I'm trying to keep this less commercial and just give you ideas. 
um, that's the way you can go. Now, if I have an overactive, fast moving uh, intestinal tract, uh, again, it's kind of weird, but true. Uh, pre or probiotics definitely play a role. Uh, fiber and people go, dude, like seriously, how does fiber <laughs> help a slow moving? Oh, but it also helps a fast moving. So we were taught this in pharmacy school when usually when people have a fast moving digestive tract, they have watery, you know, watery bowel movements. Fiber is one of the th one of those things that I used to recommend, still do when people have diarrhea, uh, to help absorb the extra water and actually uh, maybe uh, not maybe but create more bulk um, for for that bowel movement. Um, one ingredient I really do want to point out here is immunolin. Uh, this is an immunoglobulin uh, ingredient. And this would be uh, highly recommended by me for people that uh, perhaps that have that dysbiosis, they've got some sort of bacterial overgrowth and not the kind of bacteria you want. And the reason I mentioned that is they have, I think they identified 60 different uh, antigens that um, that this will work against. So, and a lot of them are, are the ones that do trigger um, do trigger diarrhea. And then chamomile is one of my favorite digestive aids um, for the people that have, uh, so uh, chamomile is not only rooted as a smooth muscle relaxant. So um, yeah, I, I know that sounded really weird to people, but um, chamomile is known to actually relax smooth muscles. Uh, and on top of that, it's also known to be a very powerful and help decrease inflammation. So when you combine those two with people that have Usually people that have a chronic fast moving intestinal tract, um, they usually have a lot of inflammation also going on in their in their bowel. So chamomile actually works really well. The only downside is can cause drowsiness. And that, you know, but you got to give or take, you know, <laughs> do you not want to have to be using the bathroom all day long uh, around the clock? Or do you want to, um, you know, have some functionality in your life and maybe a little grogginess? So supporting digestion. I just talked about the motility. Now we're talking about digestive part. Again, using my examples earlier, you know, the responsibility of supporting digestion is talking about breaking down nutrients. Again, pre and probiotics, they can pretty much fit across all these platforms. I get that. And that's why I didn't want to just spend my whole day talking about the microbiome, but also considering using uh, the digestive enzymes that are available, betaine, I mentioned earlier. Um, and then those things that help convert the nutrients, probiotics play an important role in converting some of the nutrients in your food into the absorbable absorbable form Wait, it's really stinks when you're you speak for a living and you're having trouble communicating you know that's not a good thing uh, vitamin c or any of those c containing plants uh so you know a cayenne or uh maybe cayenne is not the best choice when we're talking about digestive health but any of those things that are high naturally in vitamin c um, vitamin c is really important for converting iron into the version your body needs Again, digestive enzymes and betaine. Um, again, piece of, so enzymes, let's just like simple, simple example. Um, you know, you need amylase to break down car like starches. Amylase is secreted in the mouth. If you eat your food too quick, you probably blew it. You know, it's already it's already past your, your mouth and then your stomach. So taking enzymes can help uh, break down fast proteins, you know, uh, starches, et cetera. Uh, liver health. This is uh, one of my biggest ones. Um, the Altalix, that is the globe artichoke, probably my favorite ingredient right now for supporting liver health with regards to digestion. My favorite liver health supplements, milk thistle, because I do drink alcohol periodically. We might say regularly since COVID, but anyway, <laughs> who doesn't? Uh, no, but these are, again, most of these ingredients here are considered bitters. Um, and, and again, each one in itself, or maybe perhaps combined together. And some sort of a uh, a blend of ingredients would would be a great suggestion. And you'll notice that anything that seems to support the liver usually support supports the gallbladder. And if you hear a siren outside my hotel room, no, they're not coming to take me away in Madrid. So far, I've been nothing but stellar in my behavior here. Um, but again, we can see a lot of the ingredients that uh, work with the liver also work with the gallbladder. So I'm not going to spend too much time uh, again discussing these. The main mechanism of action that happens with these liver uh, and gallbladder supplements is really to uh, to stimulate or support the those two uh, parts of the body to secrete those uh, elements that help break down uh, foods, whether it's a fat, a protein, or even do some conversion. And then, of course, supporting the pancreas, which is um, primarily you know helping 
uh, with the production of insulin. And in this case, you know, there are several different things that will actually help support uh, the pancreatic health overall. Um, probably my favorite uh, listed on, on this one little page, I, I love uh, fenugreek seeds and I love cinnamon. Again, keeping in mind that there are a lot of other ingredients that are in the marketplace that may be better for, quote, blood sugar uh, support, et cetera. But are they really considered uh, support directly for the pancreas? We're not looking to support insulin production. We're looking at supporting the pancreas, which plays an important role in digesting your foods and your supplements. I tell you what, I don't know if you guys paid attention to the last uh, last health condition corner or yeah, health yeah, condition corner. I always want to say something different. <clears throat> but anyway, um, creating this presentation to be done in, in a 30 minute time frame it was is not an easy subject uh, to cover because I feel like in our industry, there's an awful lot of conflicting information as to what's the most important part, you know, when it comes to the digestive system and supporting it. And for whatever twisted reason, and again, I'm not completely against it, but we've spent so much time focusing on gut health, primarily the the small intestine, that we've completely blown by, you know, three other very important parts that of the, the what the digestive system's function is supposed to be. So I'm trying to get people to step back from all that. So again, supporting absorption. First thing is to support the intestinal lining. If there's some sort of breakdown in the lining and there's there's larger gaps than should be, then uh, then uh, antigens get into the body that triggers um, a whole host of other health issues. So we want to support the, the gastric lining. I mentioned immunolin earlier. They actually have a clinical study showing it helps with the tight junctions uh, that are in the, the di digestive lining. A uh, new ingredient I just learned about recently, astrogen. Uh, they actually have a new study that was just published, uh, again, with their ingredient in a, in a, actually within a disease state, which I'm not going to mention, but uh, part of the summary of, of this study or result was actually uh, a tightening of those tight junctions. So if the junction between the cells in your digestive lining becomes uh, too wide, that's when those particle sizes get back, uh, get that are larger than normal or not supposed to get into the bloodstream do get in the bloodstream and wreak havoc. It could be a bacteria, virus, bacteria, phytosis, bacteria, um, but it also could be a foreign protein. Um, whatever might be might be there can now get in. So we want to support uh, either tightening those back up or supporting the the mucosal lining throughout the whole ga uh, gastrointestinal tract. L-glutamine is one of my favorites for that. Regretfully, you need to take 10 to 20 grams a day of L-glutamine, but that's the primary nutrient used by the body to uh, support the, the digestive lining. Again, free and postbiotics. I think those all make sense. Uh, another really cool ingredient is that uh, is the mucosave um, here. And you get the word mucose. So i.e. it helps with the, the uh, protective lining throughout the gastrointestinal tract. Um, and then again, miscellaneous things that help absorption. Um, we talked about vitamin C earlier. That that's maybe for the conversion of certain you know nutrients into their available form. Uh, supporting absorption with fats should be taken with fats um, or fat soluble. Again, pre and probiotics. And then uh, if you want to bring in water, that's when those electrolytes play an important role. And I know I talked about magnesium, which is one of them. But if we're really talking electrolytes we really need to look at doing more uh, balanced mineral formulations. And then last but not least, uh, supporting secretion. Um, I hate reading slides. I've semi been doing that a little bit today. So my apologies for being a little out of sync on that. But um, when we're talking about supporting, <coughs> excuse me, the release of enzymes and hormones, we can see certain things that specifically support the stomach. Some of this is very redundant. There's a reason because a lot of these ingredients have multiple functions, especially when we're talking about botanicals, um, supporting the overall liver health. Again, granted, these things were mentioned earlier, um, but again, they also play a, a, a multiple faceted role, either supporting directly that organ uh, or more specifically supporting the production of what that organ does. And that, that's why you're seeing globe artichoke again, you're seeing turmeric again, milk thistle, et cetera. Again, so there is some redundancy here, which what is awesome for people that are doing R&D and formulating is that you can handpick maybe one, two, or three ingredients that have these multifaceted approaches and then combine them 
uh, with other ingredients and maybe possibly put together an ingredient that actually fully supports the four main functions of the digestive system. And then last but not least, within regards to supporting secretion, um, it's, it's a good idea to support the intestinal lining. And I just talked about that previously. So again, I'm not going to spend an awful lot of time here, um, but there are some really amazing ingredients that will actually support the health of the intestinal lining. You know, like I talked about either, um, either uh, tightening up those junctions in the cell membrane, I'm sorry, in the cells, or by actually helping maybe perhaps produce uh, more mucus or uh, improve the mucosal lining, et cetera. And then last but not least, if you're going to formulate for success, you know, maybe begin with a supporting food group that we know is good for digestive health. I mentioned a few already, mint, chamomile, beets, et cetera. Then pick your area that you want to support. Are you looking to support just motility, digestion, absorption? And then look for ingredients that have either, in this case, I, I'm suggesting ingredients that have multiple MOAs. So the globe artichoke altolix, which I, I mentioned it both ways here, um, you know, that has one mechanism, perhaps working on supporting the liver and gallbladder combined with an enzyme and maybe a prebiotic with a probiotic. Um, and then my favorite, new, my, my new slogan, shoot for the stars, you know, try like heck to avoid tablets and capsules and try to get creative with these ingredients. And um, Sonia, I'm going to turn it back to you. Actually, it went longer than I thought it would. So uh, it looks like we have like three or four minutes for questions. Yes. And I do have a couple for you. I'll allow you a chance to take a drink of water. <laughs> Because that was a lot of talking. Oh, I'm glad you didn't say, I'm glad you didn't say my wine. <laughs> so first question that I have for you, why do you recommend that formulators try to avoid tablets and capsules? And what does getting creative mean to you when formulating for success? So if someone has a, so tablets and capsules in this specific talk is because the, um, if somebody already has a, perhaps a challenged digestive system, uh, then there's maybe a likelihood that the tablet's not going to dissolve properly. Capsule may not. I mean, I've had people that actually had difficulty with their digestive system breaking down a capsule, which almost sounds asinine when you when you when I even say it out of, out of my own face. But it does happen. Um, so you know, things that are as as broken down as we possibly can. I also like people to you know um, think outside the box and start creating products that are can fit into my everyday lifestyle or your everyday lifestyle. So shots, stick packs, whatever. Um, in my meeting today, I was talking about, you know, it'd be really cool just to have a bar that had four or five of my ingredients that I like to take every day. So I could, you know, have that as my breakfast snack or whatever. Yeah. What is one of the, the hottest trends right now is people want to consume in gummies. So that also could be a creative Create a way to get these. Yeah, it's funny. I, I, I just saw the statistics. I think uh, it was like 22% of Americans are like, they're now getting their, or want, want to get their supplements from a gummy. And you look at the rest of the world, it's like like less than 10%. I don't know why, but, but yeah, gummies are okay. I just, I'm not a fan. I'll, I'll just leave it there. It's my own personal thing. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, I think uh, we've run out of time. That's a wrap. So many thanks to everyone for tuning in. And David, we really appreciate you taking time out of your busy international schedule <laughs> to provide us with another great episode of Health Conditions. Hold on, wait, 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 wait. Yeah. Hey, I want to promote the next talk. Okay? Absolutely. I was going to say. It's going to blow can, people's mind. On June. Can people tune in next time, June 7th for? Yeah. So the next one. The next one, we're getting sexy, everybody. We're going to talk about the taboo subject of sex, sexual health, and it will not be pornographic, I promise. There are so many things that people have issues within their sex lives that uh, never get talked about, and I'm going to talk about them, and I'm going to give people some really solid reasons as to why so many people are having these issues. And uh, the things that we have, we have some awesome ingredients in our industry to formulate with and actually help people do better. It's not about the blue pill anymore, okay? There's a lot of stuff that's going on with people, and we're going to cover that. So June 7th, tune in. Thanks, everyone. Until then, take care. <laughs>